Architecture is about the built environment, but today's guest helps lead a firm whose mission is to use architecture to help move communities forward, to promote social justice and healing, and expand the possibilities of tomorrow for cities and their residents. He's Justin Brown this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. And I'm G. Wayne Miller, also with Salve's Pell Center. Joining us today, all the way from the great state of New York, is Justin Brown, an architect who is co-founder and principal at Mass Design Group. Justin, thank you so much for being with us. So, you know, I'm thrilled uh, to have you here today because you are the first architect uh, that we've ever had on Story in the Public Square. Uh, and, I, you know, as we talked about this a little bit, but what is the role of storytelling in architecture? Well, thank you so much. That might be one of the greatest compliments, actually, to receive as an architect is uh, when architecture is seen as relevant outside of itself. Um, intuitively, architecture has always been one of our greatest vehicles for collective storytelling. Uh, it's made up of materials from the earth that we all inhabit. It reflects collective values, where we want to spend our time and our, our money and our precious resources. So I, uh, when you look at buildings in different places around the world, uh, they are embedded uh, in the fingerprints of the people that design them, that built them, but also that inhabit them. And those stories are complex and deep uh, and uh, of, of different meaning to different people who, um, who, who play different roles in that very long, long process. Um, you know, architecture is inherently um, a, a, a social act and um, a story is, um, runs deep in, in every, every, every building. So I'm looking forward to getting into that a little bit more. Well, we, were, we were chatting a little bit in the green room before we came out and uh, I said, you know, the only architect that I could think of in my literary journey uh, was Howard Rourke in Fountainhead. <laughs> and you were quick to say that's not architecture. Why isn't that architecture? Well, I, I think there's a bit of a myth that architecture is the work of a sole genius, um, you know, that uh, has a, a, a vision that is plopped down in various parts of, uh, of the world. And at Mass Design Group, we really actively try to um, dispel that myth. Architecture is the, is the work of a group, of a collective. Uh, the design team, the engineering team, the build team, and, and most importantly, the people that occupy the buildings are what define and make buildings important and loved and cared for. Um, and so I think that um, everybody is contributing to this process, um, that uh, ultimately, the act of the architect is more of that of an author or an editor that's pulling together um, threads, uh, inputs from all these competing uh, it, uh, perspectives. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, I think that's, that's, that's more rich, that's more interesting, um, and that, that really moves architecture to a scale of, of impact beyond the object. It's not about the thing, it's about the process. Uh, by which that thing came into being that, that matters so deeply. So Justin, we're going to get into mass design in a moment here, and then we're going to get very specifically into the work that you do out of the Poughkeepsie office. But I'm curious, when did you and how did you become interested in architecture? You know, you're born, you go to school, and then you can go in a million different directions. What was the influence for you? You read The Fountainhead. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's funny, but there is an element of truth to it. You know, I, I think that um, architecture as an art form was really a, appealing um, as, a, as a young art student who was interested in many other disciplines as well, you know, art, art history and physics. Um, and, you know, the idea, there was a little bit of narcissism embedded in, you know, I'm going to design something and put it in the public realm and people are going to, uh, you know, their lives are going to exist around this thing. Um, 
But I think what actually made it um, meaningful uh, as a career, as something that I wanted to pursue, was when I was able to connect that sort of individualistic, narcissistic view of the discipline with uh, under, uh, a deeper understanding of the social impact that it can have. And you know that really happened for me after Hurricane um, uh, in... in um, Katrina. In, yes. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, Hurricane Katrina in, uh, in New Orleans. I was uh, uh, just finishing my first year as a graduate uh, school student. And that was 2015, if I recall correctly. 2004, 2005. Was it, it was that Katrina. long ago? Yeah. Katrina was? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> the, the time is hard to track these days. Yeah. I know that we've <laughs> yeah. been through. Before the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but, but ultimately it was there that... Um, you know, I was able to work directly with homeowners who had experienced sort of um, uh, detrimental impact of, of flooding and didn't have access to design services to figure out how to move forward with their lives. And so being able to bring that um, uh, sort of uh, design thinking to that context is ultimately where, where the magic happened for me. And that was also about the same time Mass Design Group was founded. Um, you know, as, as students at Harvard, we really were uh, hungry to connect architecture uh, from this realm of, of, of art and self-expression um, and self-definition into uh, one that is inseparable from the, the people that it ultimately serves. So the work that Mass Design does is both domestic and international. Maybe you can start with some of the international work earlier on that Mass Design did. And I'm thinking of a hospital in Africa. Absolutely. Um, you know, the, the firm really started around a project. The Bataro Hospital in, uh, in Rwanda uh, was a project that emerged somewhat organically. Uh, as students, we attended a, a lecture at the medical school uh, by the late, great Paul Farmer, oh, yeah. who, who was talking about the importance of providing health care as the foundation to, uh, to, to, to human justice. Without access to health care, we can't really be addressing any other social challenges. And so he was actively looking to bring doctors to parts of the world where there were no doctors. Uh, Batara, Rwanda is a very rural part of the country, uh, on the northern side of the country, um, that um, he was designing a hospital and we asked him who his architect was. <laughs> and you know, he said, oh, I'm not working with an architect. And it was amazing to us, you know, um, as naive, idealistic graduate students, you know, that architecture would be irrelevant in this context. You know, haven't you thought about patient experience? Haven't you thought about the building's orientation to the sun to maximize passive daylighting and ventilation? Um, and you know, he said yes, but most importantly, we need to get doctors on the ground. And um, you know, we just said, can we design this for you? And he said, sure, if you want to do it for free. So that, that was, the, that was the, the, the beginning of the nonprofit model of architecture, which we still uh, follow today. Um, yeah. That's remarkable. So, so what are some of the innovations that you brought to that hospital in Butara? Well, I would say that, um, you know, they are... They, they come in different um, scales. From a planning perspective, uh, one of the goals of the, of the hospital was to reduce the transmission of airborne illness in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So the uh, typology of, the single, uh, of a corridor with rooms on either side of it, uh, which is, probably comes to your mind's eye when you think of a hospital in the yeah, United States. Yeah, of course. Um, we, uh, given that we were in, in Rwanda, which has some of the most extraordinary weather year-round, uh, moved that corridor to the outside of the building. And that corridor became uh, a courtyard, which was a, a place for, um, re really, that could be inhabited. That was not just about doctors and having an efficient relationship to their patients, uh, but that used that as an opportunity to expand the experience of people visiting the hospital, and at the same time, diminishing uh, the, the chances of airborne transmission in those uh, closed corridors, which uh, historically were the places where you might come to the hospital with one illness and leave with another. Uh, so really basic decisions uh, like that. Um, uh, redundant uh, natural ventilation systems so that when mechanical systems inevitably fail, uh, we have um, uh, the building is oriented in such a way that it can still breathe. 
uh, without assistance. How much of what you do now when you're working with clients here in the States is educating people about what architecture can actually do? Because I would imagine that you walk into a meeting if, it's, if you're talking about a school or a hospital or some sort of uh, 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 community space and people have sort of a very, um, we, we imagine what we have seen before rather than what's possible. How much of what you do is educating those audiences about potential? Sure. Um, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, it, it certainly depends on the context, but um, these things are, are not rocket science, right? Like if we think about, uh, you know, another uh, example from the hospital project was, you know, if we ask the question that's focused on the process and not the object, mm -hmm. if we say, how are we going to excavate for this building? Um, and, you know, we, we could rent a bulldozer from a couple hundred miles away, or we could create jobs in Bitaro and give people a sense of ownership over the hospital that is in their community. Um, I think the answer becomes really clear really quickly. So it's sort of um, by shifting the goal from the thing to the process, we um, inherently sort of uncover uh, opportunities for architecture to have outsized impact. Um, of course, context is everything. So when, when we talk about the work in the United States, where I'm focused now, uh, we'll have a very different uh, kind of uh, answer to that question. But that, 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 that is a, a really tangible way of explaining it. Mm. So let's get into the United States now. Tell us about your office. It's Poughkeepsie, Hudson Valley. What is the mission of your work there? The mission of our work in Poughkeepsie is, is really straightforward. It's to, to take liabilities in the built environment, old buildings and infrastructure that have lost its uh, intended purpose, uh, and transform them into community-owned assets. Um, we hope that by uh, you know working in place with the with the Poughkeepsie community that we can begin to heal the uh, local environment and also the community that has experienced over um, 50 years of disinvestment really since the 1960s. Mm -hmm. You talk about economic disinvestment, and, and that's true of many many other regions and areas of the country. When you when you say heal the environment, what exactly do you mean? Well. Uh, the, the story of the post-industrial American city is one that we're familiar with. You know, mm -hmm. Detroit and Pittsburgh, the Rust Belt. Yeah. Um, that story exists in the smaller, mid-sized American city as well. And that's really where our, our work is focused, between 30 and 150,000 people to okay. just kind of bookend that. And uh, the, the uh, manufacturing economy, the making of, uh, you know, goods for food, shelter, and clothing, essentially, were made in these cities. Mm -hmm. And uh, in many cases had some, um, not all, but in many cases uh, damaged the, um, the immediate environment with uh, certain chemicals and, and the like. So uh, when we take an old building that has some in industrial history, oftentimes there's a cleanup process associated with that. But there's also a number of environmental benefits to working with old buildings. There's a lot of conversation about uh, designing new buildings that use a low amount of energy. Uh, by, by working with old buildings, uh, you stand a chance to even have, a, for buildings to be generative, to be giving energy rather than absorbing energy. And the reason for that is, is because um, the, the majority of, an energy, uh, of a building's carbon emissions is from its primary structure. The concrete and the steel that's used to erect the building is an incredibly energy intensive um, and um, uh, emits the majority of greenhouse gases uh, in, uh, in the creation of a building. So if you're working with an old building where that, that embodied carbon cost has already been paid off and you're electrifying it um, so that you know, that building is, is heated and cooled using solar panels on the roof, uh, you are... Uh, creating a scenario where by breathing new life into these buildings you can actually create architecture that is 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 not an environmental sink but rather an envir a, a, a contributor that's remarkable uh, so one of the projects that you've worked on in Poughkeepsie uh, is uh, waterfront renewal tell us a little bit about that project sure um, so 
Poughkeepsie, like many middle-sized post-industrial American cities, was founded on a waterway, a creek. Uh, it's called the Fall Kill in Poughkeepsie. Um, although our, our research has identified, um, you know, many brothers and sisters that uh, were also founded on similar creeks, which mm -hmm. drove the the manufacturing in these cities of uh, of those those goods, you know, food, shelter, and clothing components. Um, so this this waterway. Um, when uh, manufacturing moved overseas, when it became cheaper to import that stuff from halfway around the world rather than make it here at home, uh, those, that waterway lost its economic function and was channelized uh, by the Army Corps of Engineers and, and paved over, largely forgotten about, um, you know, uh, is, a, is a dumping ground of sorts in, in certain parts, uh, a site of pollution. Um, but what's extraordinary about it is its potential to become an asset again. Um, urban renewal, I mentioned, was this uh, planning initiative um, in the 50s and 60s. Uh, huge op oversimplification coming here. You know, that, that, was, that was generally about introducing the car to the American uh, urban landscape and, of course, connecting between cities with the car. Uh, and we know the stories of urban renewal in, um, in cities like New York, uh, Robert Moses and Jane Jacobs plying through uh, the West Village, 7th Avenue, uh, 95, uh, dividing Philadelphia from the Delaware waterfront. Uh, in Poughkeepsie, what that looked like was two highways running parallel to Main Street, one that's eastbound and one that's westbound. Mm. Uh, and, it, and it really created, um, uh, it isolated the, the economic center of the city from the residential components of the city. Uh, one, one thing that's fascinating about the fall kill is that it, it bridges through that divide. Uh, and so if we were to restore it as a public asset, uh, as a connector, it's a thread that bridges across these physical barriers that have uh, really choked uh, Poughkeepsie's uh, potential to become the city it was intended to be. Mm. Urban Renewal envisioned it uh, as a, a city of 100,000 plus. Um, in 1950, the city's population was about 40,000 people. So the population, instead of increasing, decreased. So uh, 1980 was about 28,000 people. So we think there's at least 70,000 people that could be absorbed by the infrastructure that's, that's built in Poughkeepsie today. And the fall kill is one of those ways to reconnect the city in such a way that it can function as a cohesive whole. So tell us about the cistern. You sent some images before, and we're going to use some of those in the show. And I was fascinated. What was it? What's, what has it become, or what is it going to become? Hmm. So the, the cistern is, uh, is another piece of infrastructure that has um, extended past its intended lifespan. Uh, historically, it, it was built in the early 1900s. It was the water reservoir for the city of Poughkeepsie. It's, uh, it's an underground water tank at the uh, top of College Hill Park, which is the highest elevation in, in the city of Poughkeepsie. It's actually it made of concrete? It is. It's, a, it's made of, of concrete, um, unreinforced concrete, interestingly. Oh, that's uh, a challenge, I would, would think. Yeah, it doesn't, uh, <laughs> but because it was designed to, to hold water, uh, corrosion of steel and concrete would become problematic. Mm -hmm. So the, the <coughs> structure, it's a com uh, compressive structure. So it has vaulted ceilings and floors, much like a, a stone structure would have. Mm -hmm. uh, and that lends some really extraordinary acoustic properties to the space. So when you walk into the cistern, if you clap your hands, you will hear it reverberate for seven seconds. Wow. wow. Uh, it's, I want to go. <laughs> you, you, you've you've got to come. We invited uh, two Metropolitan Opera singers into the space, a father, really? a father and daughter, who, um, you know, if you closed your eyes, you, you could have sworn there were 100 people in there singing. Wow. Uh, and when I spoke to her, um, the, uh, the, the young woman afterwards, she uh, really uh, said how unusual it was to be able to sing in chords. So, you know, when you hit a, uh, a guitar, you hear four or five notes at the same time, same on a piano. A voice is restricted to, to one note at a time. But in the cistern, she could sing chords. You send one note out and then another and another and another. Oh, that's wild. And, and uh, it, was, it, it, it really captures, I think, the potential of the space uh, to find a second use, to find a second purpose. Uh, you bring any... Uh, 
Um, and, and there are a couple others in the U.S. Most of them have been destroyed, but uh, Houston has a, has a cistern that they've converted and used for light installations and sound installations. And if we were able to do that in Poughkeepsie, this could be a sort of economic catalyst to connect that park to the, uh, the north side of the city, which has historically seen some of the, the, the most disinvestment since urban renewal. How, so you, a couple times in our conversation here, you've talked about the history of the city that you're working in and sort of researching what it was. How much time on a project do you spend trying to unearth that existing history before you get into the, the creative or the community engagement part with, with, with partners? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, one thing that we learned working on our, uh, uh, in our memorial portfolio was that um, you have to understand how you got here in order to understand how to move forward. There is, it's very, very, very difficult to come up with a solution to a problem if you don't know how it emerged. And so, you know, urban, uh, urban renewal in the urban sense is a great reminder about how, you know, architecture is never neutral. It might have these great intentions, you know, to introduce the car, uh, but there are all these negative residual blind spots that exist in any design decision. And so we really feel that researching the past is so important to unearth those blind spots, those things that we might not be seeing. Um, you know, solar panels are great everywhere, right. but like, and I'm not saying they're not, right. <laughs> but uh, they're, they're, uh, I think it forces a, a criticality that is really essential uh, to, to bring to the design process where, um, and so to answer your question succinctly, um, and this is another reason to embed in place, we become really familiar with the context and the, the sort of, the, that context in, in, informs our work in a site that might be five minutes away from another site. Um, so, you know, there's local history, like the history of a building, this building used to be used for X, mm -hmm. but then there's, um, you know, the, the social history and the urban history, and then of course the, you know, um, the, the, the national history, which are all comp have to be considerations in this solution. And I imagine too that it also um, builds confidence in your community partners that you, you know, you're of them. Yeah, I mean, I think that we're, we're trying to earn that um, respect uh, <laughs> or that, that welcome. Uh, we've been working in Poughkeepsie really since 2011, um, but moved physically to Main Street with an office uh, on, in 2017. And that, that trust has really um, been uh, transformative, moving to the place. In fact, I've moved there with my wife and my young son and have decided that uh, cities like Poughkeepsie do hold America's future. And um, the, uh, the, the, the trust of the community in which we work is essential uh, to unlocking the opportunities within each project. Uh, we're learning from them rather than uh, bringing answers. So the trolley bond is a really good example of community involvement, getting the community there first, what do they want, and working with them. Tell us about the Trolley Barn. It's a project well underway. Sure. Um, the, the Trolley Barn was one of the earliest projects. It, it uh, spans you know, between Main Street and the Falk Hill and the highway that, that came by uh, from, from Urban Renewal. And, and so intuitively, as um, architects, urban designers, we felt this was a really catalytic site, potentially, to connect uh, between those wounds. But what we needed was the community's input as well uh, on what that, uh, what, what that should be. The trolley barn historically was where um, you know, horse-drawn carriages were pulled off Main Street to be repaired at night and the oh, horses fed. Oh, went back fed. that far, huh? Yeah. Uh, and then you know, in the 70s, it was a department store, you know, sold dresses. Uh, and when we came uh, across it, it was um, uh, illegally fit out as a boxing gym. So uh, <laughs> you know, the, the community is... is is complex, you know what, um, and 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 hearing from all of the necessary voices uh, is is an active process. It doesn't happen overnight. It is a result of being immersed, embedded, uh, being informally engaged in the lives of the people that live there. We did at the time, however, hold a number of um, of meetings in the trolley barn with the arts community in Poughkeepsie, uh, which uh, it's immediately adjacent to. Um, uh, in 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 artist studio, um, and so it seemed like a natural place to begin, but that 
that really was just a, a starting point. Today, the, the building is um, being uh, developed by an extraordinary group called the, the Artifact. Uh, they work with youth uh, in, in the city of Poughkeepsie uh, to show how uh, art, and specifically the curation of art, can become uh, a viable career path. And so the trolley barn, you know, phase one is open. It's a gallery space. Phase two will be uh, more more maker spaces, um, you know, that are purpose built for the production of art and photography and film and the like. And and phase three, connection to the fall kill. <laughs> so we, we, we've got literally about thirty seconds left. Oh wow! How does time flies? It does. <laughs> yeah, it does. All of these projects together in a place like Poughkeepsie, what do they mean in their collective for that community? Literally thirty seconds. Um, I think that embedded in this work is, uh, is hope. I think everyone senses the great potential of, uh, of Poughkeepsie. Uh, we talked about its environmental potential to absorb climate mi migrants, uh, to absorb shifting patterns of, uh, of work, remote work, changing market forces. Um, but at the same time, uh, if we work with the community that has endured these decades of disinvestment to hear their vision for what the future of that place should be, we will be able to uh, set a foundation uh, that is community-owned for when those external forces inevitably arrive. Uh, Justin, this is uh, really remarkable and important work. We thank you so much for sharing it with us. He's Justin Brown with the Mass Design Group. That's all the time we have this week, but if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on social media or visit PellCenter.org. He's Wayne. I'm Jim, asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square.